Um, thank you for coming to HPG again. The first day is coming to its close. We have a uh, reception in the uh, town hall, the real town hall, um, down the road at 6.30. Um, but first we have our final session. The, uh, I'm very proud to uh, introduce and uh, bring to the stage uh, JB, as I know him, or Jan, uh, I can't do the Dutch pronunciation, it's too hard. Jan Bart van Beek, van Beek, something like that. And uh, JB, if you don't know him, he's a legend uh, amongst video game uh, designers. He's the studio director and art director of Guerrilla, formerly Guerrilla Games, but I think they're now so big they're just Guerrilla. Um, and they are perhaps the premier game development studio in the Netherlands. Um, they're particularly known for Killzone, and then after Killzone they've had a series of smash hits with um, uh, Horizon. And a little tidbit about Horizon is I believe that there was a sort of pitching process within Guerrilla uh, to find their next game after Killzone, and, and uh, JB is the sort of the progenitor and daddy of uh, Horizon. So he's uh, one of the most technical art directors I've ever met. And what I thought would be interesting after this morning's uh, session, where we're hearing about like, uh, if you like, different ways of learning, different ways of applying high performance graphics techniques, I thought it would be interesting to invite a speaker who looks at high performance from a different perspective. So although JB can probably write the best shaders with the rest of us, uh, he's also someone who can zoom out and look at the big picture of a complete game. So in fact, that's what I would invite you to do for this talk is kind of relax. I'm sorry, JB, I didn't get you a, a sofa with a uh, roaring fire and a, and a whiskey. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I actually think it's really important to see our work as researchers, as academics and in industry as well, in the context that it's going to go to. So when you write a paper, who's it for? Um, and actually, many of the Gorilla uh, technical team are, are here to throw peanuts at JB. But, there, but it, research has to have an application. And I think that JB's here to talk about um, some disruptive ways to think about HPG. So thank you very much, JB. Thank you very much. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm very honored to talk here today. Uh, it's also a little bit terrifying. I heard there are over 100,000 people maybe watching this on YouTube, which is really terrifying. But also, you know, computer graphics engineers are my favorite kind of people. <laughs> uh, I honestly think that you guys are absolute rock stars. But I myself, I'm not an engineer or a computer scientist. I can program a little bit. I can even throw a shader, shader together if you put a gun against my head. But that's about it. Uh, so what I'm going to do today, talking to you here, is I'm going to talk about disruptive creativity. Now, who am I to think that I know anything about that? Uh, as Alex says, I'm the studio art director as well as the studio head at Guerrilla Games. And you may remember us from games like Killzone, or more recently, the Horizon game franchise. And my job is to design interesting worlds to explore, which in my mind is one of the coolest jobs to have as a job. And frankly, I owe that job to the people in this room. And I mean that quite literally, because some of those people are here in the room that I work with. Um, so here's the super short version of how we come up with games and movies. We put a whole bunch of creative types, like artists and animators and designers and writers in a room, or more likely a bar. So here's a mid-journey recreation of that event. <laughs> this is pretty much exactly like it is, as obviously we also like to cosplay during design meetings. So we chat for hours, days, weeks, uh, sometimes even years, and a big entertaining idea comes out of it. It's a world full of characters and stories and monsters and adventures. And we can up, come up with these ideas without any high-tech tools. Uh, a pen helps, and maybe some napkins or a beer mat. But then the really hard work starts, the really hard work of making that idea a reality. Because often we first need to build the thing that builds the thing. A lot of what allows us to make a game or a movie are the high-tech systems that allow us to turn an idea into a working piece of software, or a movie script into thousands of meticulously rendered frames of a feature film production. And that's really hard work. And so, as creative types, we gladly hand, gladly hand that over to you, the engineers. Now, computer graphics are a symbiotic relationship between the arts and technology, more so than ever before in history have such different skill sets been so complementary in the creation of entertainment. In my own experience, when it works really well, it has been a highly collaborative relationship in which both sides inspire each other to engage in creative problem solving, usually to get around the limits of technology that exist at the time in order to deliver a new type of experience that we hope will delight and excite our audience. Without computer graphics and the engineers who dedicate their careers to it, 
almost every single entertainment franchise in the world, from GTA and Call of Duty, from The Matrix to Lord of the Rings, from Star Wars to Avatar, none of those things would exist. And without my journey, this bunch wouldn't exist. And really, what the heck is up making with Darth Vader up there? <laughs> anyway, Killzone wouldn't exist, Horizon wouldn't exist, my job, most of our jobs here wouldn't exist. And so with that said, this should come as no surprise, I'm going to argue that CGI is the most important innovation and the most disruptive one in entertainment in the last 40 years. As I said, without it, video games would not have been possible as CGI is their fundamental ingredient since we moved on from text adventures. And of course, the development of CGI over the last 40 years or so has fundamentally changed cinema and in recent years, TV as well. Now, don't get me wrong, practical effects or analog effects, as some call them, in movies are also pretty cool. I love it when a really good practical model is used, and the simple fact that an actor can interact with it makes practical effects incredibly believable. But that does not take away from the fact that many of our favorite movies from the last two decades would not have been possible with CGI, without CGI. And it's really given a boost to the movies to industry in general. Now, there are also plenty of film lovers that are not big fans of the popularity of these CGI extravagances, full of, kinds, full of all kinds of amazing special effects. You might even, like Martin Scorsese, argue that the glut of Marvel movies had made it harder for more classic forms of cinema to find an audience. But movies are entertainment, and games are as well, and entertainment is supposed to entertain an audience. And the audience that goes to the movies or plays games are mostly younger people, and 2023 kids are simply less enthralled by stories of gangsters that lived close to a century ago. Entertainment doesn't just change because the audience changes, it also changes because the creators change. I myself from, come from a generation of game developers who have always worked on 3D console games. I've never worked on 8-bit or 16-bit generation games or 2D sprite-based games in general. My first ship game was a PlayStation 2 game and AAA video games have been my medium for all of my career. And the modern CGI spectacle movie is a medium of its own. It's a medium that was pioneered by a generation of directors who are now in their late 60s or even older. Pioneers like James Cameron, George Lucas, and Steven Spielberg. They changed the way that we think about movies. Jurassic Park is now 30 years old, and its, and its CGI dinosaurs still hold up, which is a testament to the directors, the special effects artists, and engineers who worked on that movie. But there is a younger generation of filmmakers, such as Tim Miller, James Gunn, and Neil Blomkamp, younger, as in they're in their 50s, for whom CGI has been their primary medium. They are all great filmmakers, but imagine them as the director of 1959 Ben-Hur, where every set is physical and every stunt is done by real people and you have a cast of thousands. Handling a film set like that is a very specific and very hard to obtain skill set. And it can be argued that freeing a generation of filmmakers from the burden of learning how to run such a complicated film set allowed them to dream beyond what is practically possible. I personally feel that, although CGI might still be expensive, it also allowed for new stories to be told by a generation of filmmakers who are allowed to dream up bigger and stranger worlds. And that trend is still continuing. The technology and the skills to create new worlds are becoming ever more accessible to a larger group of creators. Students are using game engines that they can download for free. And with a couple of years of training and watching a whole bunch, huge, a bunch of YouTube movies, they can build worlds that could have only been created by very large, well-funded development teams just a few years ago. So the movie you see playing was made by Taichi Kobayashi, who is a graduate student from Japan, and he made this all by himself in Unreal over an eight-month period. Similarly, readily available animation and rendering tools like Blender allow artists and filmmakers to play around with their own filmmaking ideas without the need for large budgets. The footage on screen is from a young filmmaker called Josiah, and he's making spectacular look looking Star Wars fan movies on literally, and I mean literally, a shoestring budget. And then there are game projects like Unrecord. It became an overnight hit a couple of months ago when they released a trailer of the demo. Built in Unreal by a small indie team who fearlessly pursued their own vision, and in doing so, blew everybody's minds and challenged some of the largest development teams of the world to break new ground. Instead of mimicking the polished look of Hollywood action movie cinematography, they went for the raw look and feel of modern body, body cam footage and created something that feels much more immersive and dynamic than most 
current day modern big budget first person shooters. Our creative industries are at a critical point because of what is happening with our tools right now. I've heard people call it the democratization of content creation tools. Tools like Unity, Unreal, Blender, and even Roblox are extremely accessible. And they have large support communities of users that provide an incredible amount of support for people who want to learn these tools. You can almost say that making games has become so easy that an eight-year-old can do it. And in the case of Roblox, they actually do. So at some level, this is great. Accessible, affordable tools level the playing field for creators. For example, the development of accessible and affordable digital cameras made YouTube possible. And that changed the media landscape forever. It might actually be the greatest democratization of a medium ever. Today, you don't need a super well-funded studio to make something cool and exciting. Now, with that very boring slide, it's time to get back to the bit journey slides. So it's great that new creators are able to enter the field. You see what I did there? It's people running into the field. <laughs> so, and that will surely lead to a greater diversity and choice of video games. And that's great for gamers. More choice of games also can also lead to greater competition. And it will be harder to stand out in that more crowded field. And in other in this creative industries, that often leads to a higher level of innovation because it will be important to do something that is unique and original. There, but there's a flip side to the democratization as well, which is the standardization of these tools. There are many cases where standardization of tools makes perfect sense. Imagine that every nuts and bolts making company in the world would make their own unique sizes of nuts and bolts and matching wrenches and screwdrivers. The movie industry used to be a big mess like that when it came to standards. Every studio made their own cameras and even their own film formats. But the need to collaborate with other studios just made it impractical. These days, there is a limit to the amount of film formats and, film, uh, and file formats, although there are still plenty of proprietary formats as well going on around in the movie industry. Now, of course, in software engineering, there are plenty of standards. There are quite a few, a few programming languages, and there are new ones in development at any moment. But it would be insane if every software developer uses their own proprietary programming language. But when it gets to the tools of the games industry, that is the game engine and its matching editor, more than half of the developers in the industry create their own. They are all tend, and they all tend to be highly unique and proprietary. So why is that? Well, let's start with the basics. A game engine is a highly specialized piece of software to make a highly specific other piece of software, a video game. And just as games can be very unique, the software that makes those games can sometimes also be very unique because they are the result of a complex combination of balancing choices. For example, there is the balance between flexibility and performance. Unity, for example, is highly flexible and runs on almost any platform, but it's not going to have the fastest streaming system in the industry. So it's probably not the best choice if you want to make a high-speed open-world racing game. Unreal may have some awesome ray tracing features, but those may not be that valuable if you make retro 2D pixel art games. Every game engine is the result of a long discussion about the balance between feature rich richness and performance. And that is just one of literally hundreds, if not thousands, of discussions. Let me try to illustrate that by using the one game engine I know really well. And that's Decima. So who knows Decima? Let's have some hands in the air. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. OK. For those who don't know Decima, that's OK. It's not as famous on Unreal, and it's also not as widely used as Unity. It's one of a dozen game engines that PlayStation Studio uses. And it's the only one, actually, that's used by multiple PlayStation teams. So is it any good? Well, I'd say so. Uh, last April, it won the BAFTA for Best Technical Achievement. And it also won the Best in Show Award at the SIGTIME, SIGGRAPH Real-Time Live event last year. So needless to say, we're very proud of our game engine and the recognition it has gotten. But how did we get to this point, and where did it all start? Around 2011, we were finishing working on Killzone 3, and a small team started working on Horizon. Horizon was going to be our first open world game, and we had never built an open world game. And designing an open world game is very different than from designing a game like Killzone. I've compared it in the past as a difference between designing a roller coaster, where every second is carefully designed to completely control a player's heartbeat, every heartbeat and emotion, compared to designing a theme park where you can control the over experience through cur curating the selection of attractions and working on layout and flow, 
but you don't control the visitor's experience in the park on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. They might start, for example, on the roller coaster and then go eat, and then go eat a taco, or the other way around, where they might have eaten six tacos and then do the roller coaster and then lose those six tacos. <laughs> because we had no experience designing theme parks, we hired a bunch of people who did know how to build open world games. People from Crytek, Bethesda, CD Projekt Red, Ubisoft, etc. And the first thing these people asked when they got into the company was, where is your editor? So, see, for Killzone, we never used an editor. All our content creation, including level design, was done in Maya. We could build the game room by room, area by area, and string it all together to build a game. But you can't build an open world game like that in Maya. There's simply too much data and too much content. And Maya isn't designed around the concept of, concept of constantly loading new files around you in the world. But you need to do something like that to build an open world game. You need a very specialized tool. One that brings all the developers and content creators, so programmers, artists, designers, animators, sound people, writers, etc., and give them a common tool set, a common language to create and express their ideas. Now, in my opinion, a game engine and its editor is so much more than just a tool. It's a philosophy. It's the manifestation of the desire of many different creative disciplines to collaborate. It combines the fields of art, animation, sound, music, acting, choreography, graphic design, cinema, and of course, the magic sauce of video games, interactivity, into a world of collective artistic expression. Each game is a work of art, and each one is different and unique. And the same goes for game engines. They are the result of thousands of discussions to come to an understanding of how hundreds of people from dozens of different creative disciplines will work together to create a piece of interactive entertainment. Hundreds of unique viewpoints discussed in thousands of unique conversations resulting in something just as unique as the game it can produce. And that's why every game engine is unique. There are probably several hundred game engines used in our industry. Uh, out of the 15 studios at PlayStation, 11 have proprietary game engines. That's quite a lot and it's not necessarily that typical. Ubisoft also has a handful of engines, and EA recently, for example, has moved all their development to a single engine, Frostbite. And of course, Unreal is becoming an ever common, more common solution, with Epic claiming that 50% of all announced AAA titles are now made on Unreal. But even though there are hundreds of game engines, they are an endangered species, because slowly but surely, they are becoming increasingly rare. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, building a game engine from scratch is insanely labor-intensive. It takes many years, probably close to a decade if you start from scratch. So almost no one does that. Almost no one makes a new game engine. And if you are starting a studio right now, you most likely will choose Unreal or Unity. Second, the cost of maintaining and updating your own game engines is also very high. It requires the top engineers of our, of our industry, and those are in very high demand. So less and less studios are able to support that effort. And that means that the older studios that have their own engine and they close down or switch to Unreal, every time they do that, there is one less engine in the world. And if one disappears, it almost never comes back. And with this decline in diversity of engines, we're seeing a monopolistic nature appearing. As you probably know, monopolies don't innovate. Uh, it's very expensive to be innovative. So it's an easier way to compete in such a marketplace to buy up your competitors or make them go out of business. This is a pattern we've seen time and time again with software tool makers. Once, and once all competition is gone, the innovation stops as well. I'm going to come back to the importance of competition and innovation later. Because first I want to reflect a little bit on the history and the future of CGI. This is Don Greenberg, and he's one of the earlier pioneers of computer graphics, together with a whole bunch of other people that still have algorithms and formulas named after them. Katmol, Clark, Lambert, Blin, Fong, Cook, Torrance, or Nayar. Doran, Don Greenberg and his team came up with the Cornell box, the first ground truth test. Don is now 89 years old, and he's still a professor at Cornell, and he's still doing computer graphics. He's fully into really high-end VR, and he was working a lot on foveated rendering a couple of years ago. There's an enormous amount of energy there. That's just mind-blowing. And I'm lucky enough to meet him every couple of years as we both regularly visit the same conference. So a couple of years back, we were watching a presentation from Pixar on Coco. 
And there's a shot in there where we are shown the city of the dead for the first time. It's this great, lovingly crafted shot. And Daniela Feinberg, who was the lighting director on Coco, was explaining how this shot took a thousand hours to render. Don, who really wants to see these kind of worlds in VR uh, in real time, turned to me and said, that means we need computers that are 100 million times faster. And I joked to him, well, Pixar should probably optimize our scene a little bit first. <laughs> but it made me realize something, I guess, that I already knew. You know, that super high-end, perfectly photoreal VR, it's simply inevitable. It's inevitable because it's been the course of computer graphics engineering for 50 or 40 years. Every super smart, highly optimized approximation we come up with will at some point become obsolete as the cost of compute becomes less and less of a concern. Fong, the guy that I mentioned, that came up with the Fong shading model, uh, used one set. We do not expect to be able to display the object exactly as it would appear in reality, with texture, overcast shadows, etc. We only hope to display an image that approximates the real object closely enough to provide a certain de degree of realism. Yep, so t tell that to Digital Foundry. I think we've moved on from that expectation. I actually argue that any approximation at that point is a temporary hack. There's, there is certainly work to be done to get photorealistic realistic, real time rendering for sure. It may seem hard, but only in the context of temporary insufficient compute power. We've pretty much already solved every rendering calculation for offline rendering at this point. You know, when Toy Story was made in 1995, it took several hours per frame to render this image. And now any decent PC can render it in real time. So it might take a couple of decades. But that 1,000-hour frame in Coco or that 1,000-hour frame from Avatar will be, s at some point in the future, be rendering at 8K resolution, stereoscopic, at 250 frames a second. Now, lots of software engineers can help speed that up. But as hardware gets faster, it will in inevitably happen anyway. And of course, there's, cur there's currently still a lot of skill involved in making a photo real character or scene. True, but for how long? Because making photo real images is actually really simple. Everyone with a camera in their pocket, and people produce billions of photo real images every day. And if I'm looking at advances and neural radiance fields, it seems that we're not that far away from making a photo real VR scene a really very easy task. Soon these tools and techniques that were only accessible for big, well-funded entertainment companies will become available to everyone. And like photography or cinematography, it will, of course, produce great works of art, but the vast majority of it will be very mundane, just like the vast majority of photography is very mundane. So that's going to be my hill for today. The mathematical equations to approximate ground to truth take creativity, but defining what ground truth is isn't a creative process in itself. Real-time photorealistic rendering may seem hard, but it's inevitable and not very interesting. For those that are in full disagreement, I will be available after this talk to be punched in the face. <laughs> so what do I think is worth our collective time? Well, for me, it's about doing something different. Doing something different is very, very hard. And it often takes a very, very long time. That first Toy Story, that was something different. The first feature-length 3D animated movie. And to some degree, it was the birth, or perhaps the, re the rebirth, of an art form. But there are more moments like that. Tangled was Disney's most expensive animation movie ever. It still is. It's estimated to have cost around 260 million to make, or 350 million in today's dollars. And it may not look that special now here in 2023, but it was released in 2010. And it was Disney's first full CGI animated feature film. And it took them nine years to make that movie. Now you remember, may remember that Toy Story 3 was actually released in the same year. So why did it take Disney so long to make Tangled? Well, Pixar had made a couple of very smart choices. They made their movies mostly about toys or bugs or fish or monsters or cars. Because doing human characters was very hard. Before 2010, the only movie to feature human characters was The Incredibles. But Disney couldn't really do that. Because Disney stories are generally about human characters, or more specifically, human princesses. I don't think you were expecting a slide with Disney princesses today. So the hand-animated 2D movies from Disney have a very unique visual style and a very expressive but believable animation style as well. It's clearly a quality that they wanted to maintain, 
but staying with 2D simply wasn't an option. The market had become very used to CG feature animation, and this Lee needed to shift their paradigm if they wanted to stay relevant. And this paradigm shift of taking their classic fairy tale stories and translating that to 3D animation was one of the most difficult and costly projects in the history of Disney animation. It took them close to a decade to develop their own very unique non photorealistic look. Everything from skin, eyes, hair, cloth, teeth, everything needed its own unique solution. And so here's a comparison between Tangled and Toy Story 3 Wiki that are from the same year. You see quite a big delta there in visual style and texturing and just look development. Um, to set a new visual style for an animating for over it, it took them over a decade to almost do this. To such a point now, Becky, that the Disney style has now become the mainstream look. But no success lasts forever. What caused Disney, the de Disney a decade to do was inevitably copied. Made faster, made more efficient, made easier, made cheaper, made more common, and made less interesting. And major features were in danger of losing their captivating appeal. The novelty had worn off. And then in 2018, a new paradigm shift happened. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse broke all the molds. Uh, a couple of wild minds at Sony Picture Animation wanted to reimagine what animation could look like. For them, the look that Pixar and Disney pioneered and developed had become a straitjacket, something that felt standardized. The innovation in rendering look and the animation techniques that, that had started to slow down. These animated features used to be the forefront of pioneering new techniques, techniques that had never been tried before. But from a perspective of moving the art and technology forward, what was really that new or exciting about Finding Dory or Frozen 2? So they envisioned something completely different for Into the Spider-Verse. They pioneered a look that wasn't based on photorealism or physically based lighting models, but one that was based around the concept of making a comic book come to life. And it found an audience who was extremely excited by that. It was the first non-Disney, non-Pixar movie to win the Oscar since 2011. The second Spider-Verse movie has just come out a couple of weeks ago, and for those who haven't seen it yet, go and see it right now. And I mean that, Becky, just walk out and go see that movie instead. <laughs> It surpasses the original in almost every way, and it's a big milestone for the animation industry. I would not bet against it at the Oscars this year. But what is my point here? I think as an industry, there is a tendency to work on the inevitable. Problems that may seem hard, but actually will actually solve themselves without much effort, as the amount of available compute increases. Photorealism is such a problem. As I mentioned, pretty much all problems in relation to it have already been solved in offline rendering. And while we wait for graphics cards that can easily run those offline computations in real time, we can put a lot of effort into finding temporary hacks that speed it up. There is still a lot of value in that, of course. Sometimes being the first to do something in real time that was never, be never done before allows the creation of entirely new experiences. Valve is a great example of such engineering-driven game development, where both Half-Life 2 as well as Portal delivered entirely new gameplay experiences through its gravity and then its Portal gun. But I don't really see real-time ray tracing being such an innovation to video games, except for making things look just a little bit better. There is similarly a lot of work being put into making the costly thing, either in terms of time, talent, or money, more accessible. Spanning, scanning the faces that we use for Horizon is a process that costs tens of thousands of dollars per character. So technology like meta humans is incredibly helpful to make lifelike CG humans more accessible for developers that do not have access to those sorts of funds. I honestly think Epic has done amazing work here to make the tools of game production more accessible to a larger group of people. It has an incredibly democratizing effect. But there's a flip side to this as well. Making it easy and cost effective also means it makes it, some, make, make it something that was once a rare, really rare sweet treat as mundane as bread. It loses impact. And that is the problem with the standardization of our tools. They inevitably come more optimized to do the work that is unavoidable. If the whole world is expecting photoreal games, then the mainstream tools will become really good at delivering that. Creative, creative innovation or disruption, like that of Toy Story, Tangled, or into the Spider-Verse, often requires such a paradigm shift that existing tools and techniques won't be suitable to deliver on that creative vision. These kinds of innovations require a new way of thinking and talking about what we're trying to make. 
and that leads to new insights and discussion with the en engineer who we depend upon to build the systems and tools that make it all possible. I mentioned before that a game engine is the result of thousands of unique conversations, which result in a unique outcome. Every game and every game engine is unique. And to make something truly innovative, you often also need truly innovative tools. A great example of this is the Dream Engine, the brainchild of Alex Evans, the man I was honored enough to be invited here to talk today. Dreams is a very unique tool that allows the creation of very unique experiences. But with Media Molecule ending its support for that unique tool this September, we see again how easy it is to use to lose game engines and see them disappear. As, a, as an industry, we need to find a balance here. Yes, it's important that to democratize the tools, the means of game produc the production, but we need to make sure that aspiring get young developers with big dreams have access to great tools that allow them to achieve success without the need for millions of dollars of funding. As I said, I feel this helps innovation and competition, as developers with different ideas can make their games or their movies and find an audience for them. But it's equally important to make sure the tools don't become monolithic, monolithic and standardized in such a way that they become ever more restrictive or even prescriptive in what types of games, games can be made. And to do this, we need creative visions that challenge the mainstream approach, that try to do something so unique that it needs a unique set of tools to, be ma to make it. Alex asked me to tell you what the creative community, so the artists, the animators, the designers, etc., really need from you, the engineers, the, that create the tools and the technology that make our creative visions become a reality. So I have two requests. So first off, I feel there is a paradigm shift on its way in game development. We're in a phase where real innovation is at a low point. We're mostly seeing an increase in production values or novel business models, but relatively low investment in new experiences. And this means that our industry is ripe for a major disruption by someone that is willing to take risks and think outside of the box. These are big seismic paradigm shifts, and they will need a large collaborative team effort. I mentioned that game engines are the results of thousands of unique conversations, and there are going to be a lot of new conversations coming. It may be time to kill some darlings, and it may be even time to throw out a lot of babies with the bathwater. So avoid getting too comfortable. Thankfully, the second request is a little bit less scary. It's a little bit more smaller scale, because sometimes something small can make a big change. What we want to see is your weird-ass personal coding projects. They can be ambitious or audacious, or they can be small and cute. But show us your weird tools and toys that you've been working away in secret. The artists, writers, and animators, designers, and audio people in this industry absolutely love new weird tech, and it inspired us. Tools like Alex Dreams or Inigo Quiles Quill Tool uh, are passion projects that were made by a small team or even a single person. Tools that allow whole new ideas to be expressed, or stories, or worlds that were never possible before. The work you see on the screen here is by an artist called Alex Stephen Martin. And he was already an amazing illustrator, but a tool like Quill allows him to turn his illustrations into amazing immersive storytelling pieces. Without a word tool like Quill, this wouldn't have existed. And so that's my ask for you today. Go and build something weird. Thank you. Thank you so much, JB. Um, listening to that, I, I sort of think of it as a, you're granting us permission to go and do weird stuff. Um, yep. and go do weird stuff. This is a top-down view, and I think our job is to figure out the papers, the bottom-up perspective of how we allow JB to build the weird stuff from the individual pieces that we're building. You know, we're focused on milliseconds, we're focused on kilobytes, and how fast we can render this, or how well we can approximate that. But um, we're being given permission, effectively, to try some stranger things, and I think that would be very cool. So um, we have time for questions. Um, we have to be out at half past, but that gives us plenty of time to, uh, to talk to JB. So has anyone got any questions? I've got the, the cube of destiny. It's a quiet. Uh, oh, we've got one in the middle. I'm not going to throw it. I'm too mal coordinated. Right, thank you. Yeah. Um, my question is related to dreams. I mean, it's a super great game, um, but why is it stuck on PS4? Like, if it comes out for PC or <laughs> something, then it would <laughs> explode. Um, I'm, well, I, the question would be for JB, but I, I no longer work there, so I don't know. Okay. 
Short answer. Is it, what, is it the, the question was about dreams? Oh, uh, I don't know. Okay, he knows better. <laughs> I don't work with Media Molecule. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in today's age of artificial intelligence with rising um, technologies like ChatGPT taking away the jobs of artists or programmers who might enjoy their work in C CGI, how, uh, what measures should we put in place so that we balance the passions of the people working on these projects and also the outcome of these projects? The, the outcome in terms of the quality of what we're trying to build. Uh, I don't know, okay, I'm not a legal expert. Okay, the, the, the way that I look at AI is that it is something okay, that first of all needs a level of consent. Uh, okay, if you're gonna be training okay, a model on data, okay, then people okay, who participated okay, or lent their data okay, need to be given, asked for consent whether their data can be used like that. And I think okay, that's a really important aspect that's currently being overseen uh, by a lot of the companies okay, that are racing to market here. Uh, I think okay, there is not only a legal discussion to be had, but also an ethical discussion okay, that we need to have okay, as programmers and, and artists and creators okay, in the entire industry on how we want to deal with this. Uh, I think okay, that, that is a very large discussion. I'm not one, the one to answer that. Uh, you know, I certainly have my views on it, but you know, I'll, I'll keep those to myself right now. Well, uh, thank you for your talk first. Um, I would like to ask, could you maybe share a little bit of your experience on uh, how designers and engineers and artists and engineers, how communication between those two groups goes? For example, as a game designer, you come up with this really crazy out there idea and you're all sitting at a table with a couple of beers and thinking, yeah, let's do this. Uh, and then you show it to the engineers and they all get scared. Uh, uh, the engineers come in all sorts of shapes as well. Uh, okay, uh, some okay, want to okay, see a paper design okay, that covers every edge case in existence. Uh, okay, that is almost never possible. Uh, I think okay, if, you, if you're a programmer and you're good at prototyping, okay, then you are usually okay, aren't that scared of that. Okay. You kind of love the iterative process okay, of working with a designer directly. Uh, but okay, yeah, if you're making something okay, that is going to be, you know, a three-year project, okay, very specific to a, a, a single feature, then you probably okay, want to have a really good think about what you're doing ahead of time. So okay, it's, it's all dependent on what you're doing. Uh, in general, okay, there are programmers okay, that really work really well with designers. There are programmers that really work really good with artists. Uh, as I said, okay, it, it's, it's different skill sets okay, on how that works with communication and collaboration. Thank you. Good one. Okay, thanks uh, for the talk, thanks for the throw. Um, so you were talking about the death of game engines. So my question is, um, so for example in Horizon, what does it have that you could not do, for example, with Unreal or some of these big game engines? Um, it, I'm not making any publicity here, I just. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's frankly still very hard to do a very large open world streaming game in Unreal. Uh, that's, I've never worked with Unreal, but from the people that have tried to do that, they certainly thought that was challenging. Um, Unreal does a whole bunch of things extremely well, uh, but making open world games is still not one of its strengths. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was curious when you were, you know, you started Killzone and, you know, it's a completely different game. How was the process of going from a game in terms of tech and your vision? Like, you have never made an open world game like Horizon. How did you get to that point where you feel my vision can be completed and you f see it's feasible to do? Because obviously it's, uh, you know, an idea has to be turned into something that has to be real in the end. How did you manage that process? Uh? Uh, that, 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 that was first of all a very technical process. Okay? I think we looked very carefully okay, at what was out there in terms of available tools. Uh, this was a point okay, where you could actually download the creation engine okay, from Fallout, for example. CD Projekt Red okay, had okay, given access to their tools for modding. Uh, and actually looking at those tools and picking apart how they worked, talking to the people okay, that worked at those companies and explaining okay, what their workflows was, okay, was a very large part of understanding the tools that are needed to make an experience like that. 
Uh, but beyond that, of course, there's also a giant mind shift that happens, Becky, when you go to a different model uh, like that. Becky, the, the designers that worked on Killzone, Becky, really understood, Becky, their sort of like corridor shooter structure, Becky, on how to control, Becky, every aspect of the experience, and going to an open world game, Becky, where you know people might come to your quests with whatever weapon load out or from any direction or wherever point in the game, uh, Becky was for them, Becky, a very big challenge, Becky, to think, uh, think about that and Becky sort of wrapped that into their design experience. Thank you. I kind of wanted it thrown, that's okay. Um, <laughs> thank you for the talk. Um, I was a little bit thinking about your discussion about like, how we're ripe for innovation right now in the game industry um, and I'm kind of wondering, what advice you would give for individuals who are maybe a bit like, are looking at the innovation that is happening, but they're scared because the innovation can tend to be faced with failure or with not as much uh, promotion, like Into the Spider-Verse is very popular, um, but it might be very terrifying for people to innovate when they realize that it, they might just be faced with failure in that space, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, failure is great, Maybe failure <laughs> makes you, makes you learn from your mistakes and maybe then try again and do better. Maybe I think maybe that to some degree, maybe having a, a hit right out of the, the gate maybe is actually maybe sort of limiting maybe for a company or development team because then maybe they're a one hit wonder and they're gonna do that forever and ever. Maybe having to done projects and see projects fail, I think maybe makes you a more hardened, experienced dev. Maybe that is also maybe more flexible maybe when they're thinking about problem solving and what to come up with next. Thank you. Um, how important is it, is it for, for game studios to really work closely with hardware vendors? Um, maybe an example like Unreal Engine worked with uh, Microsoft to get this hey, render graph. A little bit closer to the oh, sorry. How important is it for game studios to work closely with hardware vendors or um, API uh, company, uh, companies that make the APIs? Because, for instance, Unreal Engine or Unreal recently um, developed together with Microsoft this render graph um, feature for DirectX 12. And is innovation kind of connected to, to having access to this um, vendor-specific things? Um, I don't think Wiggy, we use a lot of middleware anymore. Maybe you can throw the microphone to Jeroen and he can answer that question. Um, Jeroen, can you, could you answer that question? <laughs> what was the question again? Sorry. How important is it for game studios to work closely with hardware vendors? For instance, you we guys do, we do work Sony with maybe and yeah, maybe. well, uh, obviously Sony works uh, works with hardware vendors because you use some hardware obviously from other uh, 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 factories and things like that so and we do work with uh, uh, teams from AMD and Nvidia and sometimes also with uh, with Microsoft but it's hard to get get like things worked out from the ground up if you know what I mean so we we chat regularly about uh, conceptually where we're going what we think is important and we get feedback from them so uh, I think it's a collaborative effort that uh, we, we can't demand anything really. You can say, well, this is what we're the direction we're thinking in. So you don't get um, back doors or something like that for... for no, no, absolutely not, no. Now there's, there's certain like driver level things that we can't control that sometimes is done by the, uh, by the, uh, the maintainers or the drivers that they do for particular games or they do for all games if they can, but we don't have any, any say in that, so... Uh, I mean, I'm asking especially because like integrating AI into rendering is always a bit hacky as it is right now, and there are not really these interfaces established to do this kind of things. Um, so in, in such a case, it maybe would have to work with hardware vendors or just a thought. Yeah, yeah I don't, uh, I, I'm not working on that right now, so I, don't, I wouldn't know how to answer that really. Okay, thanks. Could you share more on what? Could you share more on what you kind of needed to justify to, to basically branch out and write out your own thing, um, like making the case to business, for example, because then you needed to hire a lot more engineers. 
So what, what did you need to sort of prove to, to, to the higher up ma upper management that sort of you, we need to make our own engine to make this game? Uh, so so we, we had always made our own engine. Uh, so that was our starting point. Basically. So that it's different. Basically, I think pretty much every studio that came to Sony basically came in there basically with their own engine. Uh, some switched Peggy engines over time, Peggy that happens as well. But if you look at Peggy, sort of like the, the larger studios like Naughty Dog, they have their own engine technology. Santa Monica have their own engine technology. Insomniac has their own engine technology. We have a lot of different engines, Peggy at PlayStation. Um, you had a couple of references. You had a couple of references to like neural or AI rendering technology. There, have you seen any sort of tools that make authoring AI or neural, like neural materials or stuff that's good for artists, or or would you think work needs to be done in that area? Or how do you see that developing? Uh, so, so things are in a very early stage, Becky. Right now, Becky, the the sort of policy is Becky to not really with engage with these tools yet, Becky, till. The larger discussion has has sort of been had, maybe on the ethical and sort of legal and moral implications of the tools. Uh, people are certainly maybe experimenting with them in their free time, but maybe it's it is way way too early to start using these tools in production. I think that's it. So um, uh, please, everyone, join me in thanking uh, JB for his fantastic talk. So now we just have a little bit of time. Um, I think I guess we'll see you at the reception at the town hall. Um, David, did you want to say anything to wrap up? Or nope. see you at the reception. Thanks very much, everybody.